Welcome to Retire Smart with David Brooks. I'm Chip Maxwell. Oh my goodness, we have a lot to cover this week, David. You're out of town for the local radiothon for the Open Door Mission Camp Plus Care. Uh, this is for homeless children not only go to a summer camp, but they get year-round life skills and, and recreational programs. And uh, I pinch hit for you. Retire Smart offered a $5,000 match. David, the match was met, so we raised 10 grand for Open Door Missions Camp Plus Care. Uh, it was fantastic. It was very much appreciated, I can tell you that. That's that's uh, really awesome. So $10,000, because I think it only cost them about $50 or something. They pay it at $49 per child so you know, to do this. So that's a lot of kids. 200 kids then, right? Okay. And yeah. the sad truth is they need it, David. Uh, you know, in the studio, there were pages and pages and pages of young children's names who would benefit from this program. But thank you. Well, any of our listeners to this show were part of that match on one of our stations. You know, we're on thank a lot of stations, but thank you so thank much you so for much. Watching because mm -hmm. 200 kids now thanks to uh the gratefulness of others as well uh, are going to get to go to camp and again as you said they've turned this into a year-round program where they right. get access to all kinds of computers and stem and, and play stuff and, and uh, anyway just it's a it's a phenomenal program we're happy to sponsor it every year so i'm glad to hear it went well now you were out of town when that happened you were in indianapolis and i thought the official story is you know you were giving a keynote address on tax planning but i saw pictures of you throwing pizza but was this a throwback thursday to your days as a pizza restaurateur what was going on in indianapolis well you know i i've been taught by what i think are the best and keynote speakers out there. So I've always learned you never walk up and start, hey, thanks for letting me be here, yada, yada, which is what 99% of speakers do. You always want to kind of catch your audience off guard. So my opening act was actually, there was a, a giant picture on the screen behind me of, of me uh, about 150 pounds ago <laughs> when I was 18 and, and running one of the largest, you know, pizza chains, the uh, most uh, uh, high volume in the world at the time outside of Disney World's doors. And so, yeah, I actually had a, a pizza dough and actually pulled it off the table and actually threw it. I haven't done that in a while. I'll catch the audience's attention and then I kind of related that to why that you know why they I was speaking to a couple hundred advisors and why they needed to get tax planning as a differentiator in their practice number one to help them grow their practices but two their clients desperately need it and I kind of tied it in just so you know as to what was Domino's Pizza my old employer what was their differentiator way back in the day it was 30 or free right 30 minutes or free uh, speed was their differentiator they didn't have to necessarily have the highest quality product you know as long as they put a quality product out uh, the speed was the differentiator and they dominated the marketplace for a couple of decades before, you know, things like today, you've got Grubhub and DoorDash and all that stuff. But anyway, so yeah, it was kind of fun to tie that in and, and actually make sure I still had a little bit of a skill sets there from my uh, pizza days. And if you don't know, I used to own actually four different pizza restaurants. I've, uh, I've made well over a million pizzas in my life, uh, literally. And, uh, you know, speed was uh, a prerequisite. We actually set, just interesting, just so you know, I was, I, I ran the store outside of Disney World stores, but we actually set world record 17 times in Seabreeze Avenue in Daytona Beach during spring oh. break. And so they would actually pay me extra money to go up there for about three weeks, put me up in a hotel just to slap out pizzas because I was one of the fastest in the country because they would sell over $100,000 of pizza a week during spring break. And uh, that store would normally do about $8,000 a week, just to give you some reference points. So, <laughs> Well, now that we're on YouTube, we may have to incorporate pizza throwing into our presentation here. We'll see. Uh, all right. Well, uh, uh, we finally got the story on that. Back here, David, uh, there was an event just this week at Retire Smart. Actually, you're going to focus more on it in the second segment today. But we had a real estate investment event. I'm just going to say this. You know, you were kind of thinking, well, maybe we'll get 15 or 20 people. But 80 people, they, we had to clear the tables out of Midwest Learning Center and just go with chairs. Oh, my goodness. Uh, so, well, you know, when I, I recorded a video when I was in Indianapolis in my hotel room that morning and yeah. just inviting our own clients, this was just for our clients, but I figured on three or four days notice, we'd only have, you know, two dozen or so respond and, and that was okay. But the, the partners of the, that came in and, and, and gave the, the bulk of that presentation, that's the only day they could be here. It's like, ah, well, we'll just, you know, we'll get you in front of a dozen or two dozen folks. <laughs> and so anyway, that was really uh, well received. And again, we'll talk a little more about that with Eric coming up. Finally, the 76th College World Series opens up this weekend. Actually, last night, Friday night, it began, and it's up and running. 73rd in a row here in Omaha. 
So David, the, the Florida Gators are here. You're not really a Gator guy though, are you? I'm not. I actually did root for them in 2017 when I moved here. I actually went to the final game. Oh, okay. Uh, Melissa and I went there and it was a sea of purple because it was LSU. Oh, I yes. guess the Gators in the final game. I actually watched the Gators win the championship that yeah. year. And I did pull for them just because they are from Florida. So, uh, you know, if I don't find a favorite other than that, yeah, I will pull for them. But I'm actually, you know, I grew up in Virginia. I'm a UVA fan and that's, you know, the Gators and, and, and UVA started off, you know, the, the the, the games here, or at least one of the first two games uh, on Friday. But, uh, yeah. you know, I like to kind of pick the underdog. Well, you know, you got some good ones here coming to Oral, Oral Roberts, Roberts, et cetera. Yeah. So, Maybe the Cinderella uh, slipper fits fits uh, Oral Roberts this year. I, you know, the good thing is it just blesses our economy here with so much influx of How you know, cash. Something like flow. $100 million impact easy, for the easy. local economy. Uh, and yeah. so, you know, well, and the Herald usually puts a story out afterwards, kind of, you know, after they tally up the receipts Crunch and sales numbers, tax yeah. Yeah, and what it did. Yeah. But, I mean, all the uh, hotels, restaurants, bars, grills, et cetera, will all do really, really well, you know, over the rest of the month, et cetera. So we're, we're blessed with that. And just hopefully we have some really nice weather, too, and not too hot. Because last year, actually, my brother Lou, he's on our team, took my mom to one of the games I had tickets for. And it was so hot. It was just unbearable. She actually had to go, unfortunately, to one of the I was uh, at that stations. Game. We, yeah. were, we were, they were beautiful, great seats in left field, uh, but we were roasting. It was hot. Last so year. hopefully a little better weather for this year. This so. year. Yeah, you're right. It could be a Florida LSU uh, rematch again this year. Uh, LSU, that was, a, that was a tough assignment for Florida because uh, there are fans from LSU. They come up here even when LSU is not in the College oh, yeah. Series. There's purple, so, there's purple everywhere right. up here. Yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, we'll keep an eye on that as, as that uh, annual tournament unfolds. All right. Well, that's about six minutes of happy talk, David. Now we've got to get into the news. And the first headline from Zero Hedge, the end of easy money. Bankruptcy filings pile up at fastest rate since 2010. And I know the gist of the story is, David, maybe this is economically necessary. It had to happen, but but it's investors that are going to pay the price. Well, well yeah, there's a, there's about 300 companies gone, basically. Uh, and, and people don't pay attention, right? And because the, the stock market, at least the, the main industry most people are going to follow is either the Dow Jones or the, or the S&P 500. And the S&P is up, you know, around 13% or so year to date, you know, as of this recording. But it's only seven stocks carrying the load. There's there's carnage everywhere, Chip, and smaller publicly traded companies. We're seeing bankruptcies pick up, and that is probably going to accelerate. And that has a lot to do with the, the, the easy money phase is over, right? The idea that you could just go borrow your way out of uh, of stressful times and get 0% interest on a loan to fight through, you know, maybe some growth spurts on a company or, or, or if you were underwater for a little while until you could either get acquired or downsize or cut costs. And so now they're, they're, they're just having to, Go ahead and file bankruptcy. And that's leading into other problems, especially in the real estate market. Two more hotels, Chip, and I didn't send you an article. It's two more hotels in San Francisco, 3,000 rooms in downtown San Francisco just closed their doors, <laughs> right? We actually have someone who's going to ask about that. That's one of our questions in the Q&A. That made national news. When yeah, so we're starting right to see some... Before. Yeah, yeah, so we're, we're seeing some, some trouble across the bow for sure. And, and then on top of that now... We think that you're going to see commercial real estate. And it's funny, we talked about this at our, our, our private real estate event. There's going to be amazing opportunity in real estate, but there's also going to be a lot of carnage. And you have to understand where you're where you want to look for that opportunity. There's areas of real estate that can flourish in, in, in times like this. And there's times that there's areas that are, are probably not going to be so well. And that the area that I would be very cautious on is commercial office space, right? So during 2008, 2009, Chip, it was the housing market that got clobbered. That's not going to happen this go around. Sure, housing prices we talked about are starting to recede and slow down the pace of it, but we're so short on the amount of housing units of needed in this country. And most people are locked into a lower rate mortgage, So, and they have equity in their homes. So even as they get there, there'll be a mild amount of foreclosures and things like that, but it won't be anything like the 2008, 2009, 2010 period in housing. But it will be worse, much worse than that, in commercial real estate. And, and and we saw a mall in San Francisco collapse as well. Uh, financially collapse, of course, I'm talking. Uh, and, and so commercial real estate is really on the down. In fact, there was a, an article I sent you talking about 300 banks could get wiped out by this downturn because they have all this debt on their books. And as these guys walk away from you know, just, you know, never mind, we're going to walk away. You can have the building back. What are they going to do with it, right? And so they're going to need a bailout of some uh, form and that, it doesn't bode well for for that area. The, the story was from the American Banker website. It was a study done by Coldwell Banker Richard Ellis, 
and yet 300 or more banks. You know, you've, you've been predicting this for weeks or even months, David. You, I said, is there a stealth run? You said it's not really uh, or, or a slow motion run on banks. You said, it's not slow motion. It's quiet. It's not getting much attention, but it's happening. And now we're seeing it come to pass. Um, David, you sent me a story uh, also from Zero Hedge about the Lira plunges after Erdogan appoints co-CEO of failed First Republic Bank as new central bank governor, and you added the tag on it. What could go wrong? <laughs> yeah, so this is the person who was leading the bank, the, the second largest bank failure in U.S. history that just happened here recently, uh, is now going over to Turkey, which is the lira, just so you know, has fallen almost 80% or a little over 80% against the U.S. dollar in the last five years. So the cost of living in Turkey is astronomically high right now. I mean, inflation and 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 their president has just been, no, we're not going to raise interest rates. That's how you typically fight inflation. He, in fact, lowered them, creating more problems with inflation. Now, since I sent you that article, he just brought in one of the old leaders of Turkey to help right this ship and because they are in catastrophe right now. So, uh, but that's the problem is places like Turkey and then all of Europe, and by the way, I didn't send you the article, Europe is officially now in a recession as of last week. Europe entered a recession, and we talk about it, there's imminent recession coming here. Uh, when they'll actually call it a recession here, I don't know because it's so politically motivated the way we do this today. Our service sector is doing great, but goods and manufacturing sectors are in uh, dismal, dismal shape. And Chip, of course, we always talk about the way I define a, re a recession. We, we had one last year, right? They didn't want to say that, but two negative quarters consecutively of GDP. What nobody on the talking head shows or the news is talking about is, is GDI, gross domestic income. It's down 2.3% and 2.5% respectively the last two quarters. That is predicting economic catastrophe coming uh, because our incomes are down across the board. Gross income for the country is down. I would ask you though, how is that possible if we created all these new jobs? <laughs> yeah. Because half of them are right. part-time, et cetera. So, Lots of things to dive into the numbers and, and, you know, historians will go back and look at this economic period. And I don't know which government agency did the biggest fibbing, but they're not using the same statistics they used to use. And that's become quite evident. Well, David, you made the point just a few moments ago. There is carnage and there will be more carnage, but there are also opportunities. Get the complimentary report card, 402-369-7777. We'll look at your whole financial situation. Maybe you're in good shape. Maybe you need to make some changes. We also come up with a series of recommendations on how to proceed in this uncertain environment. No charge, no obligation. Complimentary report card, 402-369-7777. 402-369-7777. Up next... Serving high net worth families requires a range of options for retirement planning. Retire Smart has a special division dedicated to that purpose. It's led by Eric Blankmeyer, and he joins us next on Retire Smart with David Brooks. Welcome back to Retire Smart with David Brooks. I'm Chip Maxwell. Retire Smart wants to be your one stop shop for all your financial matters. High net worth families often require unique financial strategies. Retire Smart has a division called Private Wealth dedicated to properly serving those families. The leader of Private Wealth joins us today. David, please introduce our special guest. Hey, Chip. Yeah, thank you so much. Our first time having uh, our guest today on the show, Mr. Eric Blankmeyer, uh, one of our newest uh, members of the team. Been on board for several months, actually, already now. But uh, anyway, Eric, hey, thank you for taking time to... Uh, uh, get out of your busy schedule, which we're keeping you hopping very busy in uh, multiple areas with the practice now, but uh, we're so glad to have you on the show this week. Well, thanks, David. And yes, it's been great to be part of the team here at Retire Smart and certainly enjoying everything that we're doing and particularly with private wealth. And maybe before I go in and speak a little bit about private wealth, I'd like to just share a couple of quick stories here regarding the Bible study that I was doing this morning. And the first would be the story of Joseph, as we know it in Genesis chapter 41. And I'm not gonna go play by play, but, but we do know the story of, about Joseph and the ability to interpret dreams and Pharaoh. And you know, in the end, Pharaoh saw something in Joseph because obviously he entrusted him with what we are told, a fifth part of Egypt. 
And so Joseph, as we see, becomes very industrious. He starts collecting corn, and we know we are in the Husker State here. Yeah. And again, through his vision, through his business acumen, he starts laying up corn from this vision. And then we know the end of the story, which is when the seven years of famine come, Joseph is so wise that he starts selling the corn we are told also in the verse that all countries come unto him. But again, he's a good steward. He's going into that gathering of corn business, amongst many other things. And I think private wealth, and I'm going to make a connection here, folks, I promise you. But then I switched over to Matthew as well, and reading in Matthew about the Savior and the parables of the talents. And we know that story too, where we have one man gets five, one servant gets two, one servant gets one. And at the end of that story, we learned that there were two very profitable servants, one that wasn't, that one got reprimanded, of course. However, in these stories, I like to draw that distinction or liken those scriptures unto us in 2023. And that is, as we are accumulating wealth, whether we're high income earners, whether we are business owners, that we have a responsibility with that wealth. And along with that, it gives us that opportunity here, which I just really enjoy the role that I'm in, to help being a good shepherd to those that I have that really tremendous blessing of serving them well, let, let's talk about that for a moment. So in the role in, in private wealth and folks, just what that means is typically clients that have acquired a little more than they'll ever probably use up or spend typically $5 million and up uh, in assets accumulated. Uh, most of them are really serious about trying to be good stewards of their dollars. One of the things we practice and preach here. And of course, as you probably know from listening to the show for any length of time, I'm not a big fan of sending it all to the IRS or the government because they're just not good stewards with the distribution of those dollars, at least in my humble opinion. And so one of the things that we help clients that do, uh, you know, have done better than most that have acquired, you know, significant wealth is understand how to be proactive. And this is the key. You got to be proactive in the planning so that your wishes are met, but you're also making sure that your legacy planning is set up in a way that you're not going to be hit from left field because unfortunately we're some, one of six states that still imposes an inheritance tax, et cetera. Uh, and, and of course, we have some estate tax issues coming for most of those families in two and a half years because the numbers on those limits change drastically. And so Eric is able to, you know, kind of help work with that, that client segment spe specifically to mitigate, you know, some of the, the problems that people don't even realize they have. And so that's part of our process following that proprietary smart process is uncovering, you know, the challenges and the uh, maybe the things that are going to hit your estate from left field that you're not even prepared for. So we're really excited. And just so you guys know, Eric was with TD Ameritrade here in town for, he spent what, about 15 years there or something like that? <laughs> about 13. Yes, Okay, sir. so he spent a, a good chunk of time there. And then he worked in private wealth with another very large uh, uh, investment firm uh, that is nationwide and one of the largest in the country. And we were able to uh, pick him off, if you will, and uh, have him join our team. And so we're blessed to have him here and, and join the team. So uh, again, Eric, so cool to have you on the show first time. So welcome to Omaha and welcome to Retire Smart. <laughs> well, thanks again, David. And it is, it is my pleasure to be here. You know, as we were talking yesterday, we had a function, which I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on here a little bit, but what's really fun for me is to be back here in the state of Nebraska. Short version is my great grandfather came from Germany to Ellis Island to Pender, Nebraska. So it's really just for me, almost a spiritual journey in a sense to be in the state where it all happened for the Blankmeyer family. Now, given that, I did want to say maybe a few things about uh, private wealth. And that is, again, kind of tying back to the story of Joseph and the Savior with the parable, is that as we accumulate wealth, we, we usually have what we call the wealth life cycle. And that is the accumulation phase that we go through as we're in the grind and we're going day to day and we get busy and you know, we're doing those things, we're raising our family, we're running a business, we're, um, 
you know, again, maybe we're a highly compensated executive or whatever it is, you've accumulated wealth. Then we see those clients go into what's called the preservation phase. And then of course the distribution phase. And for us, we have created a framework here to help minimize your taxes, to monetize and protect those assets, and then to maximize that growth and then the transfer of wealth in the most efficient manner. You know, what's interesting, David, I just share a little tidbit here with the audience is that today we have roughly 70 million baby boomers in this country. 12 million of those baby boomers own privately held businesses and the professionals out there put about a $10 trillion price tag on all those businesses combined. And those are going to have to pass, or, you know, and, and I always tell people, look, there's only five ways you get rid of that business, right? You, you die, you get disabled, you, you know, you might lose it in divorce, bankruptcy, or you sell it, right? You want to be proactive no matter which version happens or occurs to you that it, it transfers in the most efficient way absolutely possible. Yes. And, you know, I think what we see, David, while every owner has the best intentions because they might have a series of professionals, CPA, business attorney, you name it. But what we often find is that they're not communicating with each other. And hence, that's where the problems begin, folks. And that's why we're so excited about having this offering here where we pull it all together and we have experts all across the country through a virtual family office offering that we have and just so excited to be bringing this here to Omaha and to really contribute back to our communities. Yeah, and so specializing in helping families that have, have done a little better than most, but they they also get advantages uh, to accumulating wealth because they, they, they will qualify for different investments. So we actually had uh, an event here in the office this past week where we had accredited investors uh, come in on very short notice and, and, and basically we talked about a private real estate offering that was available to them. But when you're a credit investor, it typically means you have at least 1.5 million in liquid investable assets. And there's other offerings that you'll be able to bring to the table, folks that are what's called qualified investors. And that means they have 5 million in liquid investment out, uh, investable assets. And these investments are targeted and geared towards folks that are trying to exactly maximize the efficiency of those assets, not just generate the return, but understand the tax implications of how you invest, the titling of your assets, and ultimately the transfer of that wealth. So there's a lot that goes into that. And then so Eric also works closely with Abigail and our team with TaxSmart in preparing a proactive tax plan for those entrepreneurs we talked about, because as you said, $10 trillion in wealth in privately held small businesses across America over the next 15 years are going to be changing hands, right? Whether the business owner wants to sell it or succeed it down to children or, or bring in new partners or get acquired, whatever it is. And, and as you all saw this week, we just talked to a, 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 an eye surgeon yes. that basically, you know, was almost crying when I explained to him the way he sold his business last year before he met me, what, what would have changed? <laughs> and he just contacted us a little prior. So, so it's amazing what you can do with proactive planning. So uh, if you'd like to have a, a, comp a complimentary consultation, I can't even talk this morning, uh, with Eric or anybody on our private wealth team, you can give us a call and uh, you know be happy to set up just a, a, a simple 15 minute phone interview to an ask any just preliminary questions. There's no cost or obligation, but we're really excited. We are out of time for this week's segment, Eric. So thank you so much for stopping by. Great to be here and look forward to meeting more people in our community. Very good. All right, Chip, what do we got next? Up next, you have questions, David Brooks has answers. Q&A is next on Retire Smart with David Brooks. Welcome back to Retire Smart with David Brooks. I'm Chip Maxwell. Into the Q&A we go. First question, David, is about 401ks. I recently heard the term dollar cost averaging described as a strategy for investment. After hearing the description, it sounded like what I do with my 401k. Can you define dollar cost averaging and confirm that it's how a 401k operates. Well, yeah, so a dollar, dollar cost average means you're, you're, you're putting the same amount of dollars in on, on, a, uh, on a periodic investment, weekly, monthly, whatever it is. So you're consistently investing the same amount of money. So typically in your 401k, that's exactly what you're doing. You're gonna set aside a percentage 
of your salary. So let's just say someone who was making $100,000 a year and they decided to defer or, or set aside 10% to go in their 401k, right? So basically they're gonna have, uh, in that example, about $840 a month would get invested every single month like clockwork into their 401k. And so what it does is if the price goes up, you're still buying, you're buying less of the equity. When the price goes down, even though you see your account value down, you're buying more of the fund or the shares of whatever the investment that you choose inside there. And so over time, it can lower your average cost per share and increase your overall rate of return. So that's called dollar cost averaging. And it's a good discipline way, especially early in life, to get people to start investing. So in other words, when you're investing, Chip, you don't always, you just don't always want to just throw the whole thing in on this on day one. And so dollar cost average is a way you can periodically invest in, in something over time. And granted, you may be paying a higher price later, but you take a little less risk and you average out your, your blended rate of return. It also works that way in fixed income instruments like bonds, et cetera. So dollar cost average is exactly what you're doing through a workplace retirement account like a 401k, 403b, et cetera. David, the next question is about a massive loan default. You alluded to this in the first segment of the program today. Let, let's flesh it out here. So the question is, I heard you recently talking about ghost towns in the middle of major cities. I'm going to step away from the question for a minute. You also were talking to me about office space that's empty and office towers that are empty in the middle of major cities. All right, back to the question. Ghost towns in the middle of major cities. Then I saw a story about the owner of the largest hotel in San Francisco just walking away from the property, abandoning loan payments and forfeiting the hotel to the lender. How can it make sense to abandon a holding worth nearly a billion dollars? Well, okay, there's many factors that go into the reason they made this decision. And so just so you know, so this was owned by a, a REIT, which is a real estate investment trust. And the property was actually leased to Hilton properties, at least one of the two big hotels. Hilton I, Union Square yeah, Hotel? Yeah, and I think I recently Square. talked on the show, I actually stayed, stayed in that, that very yeah. hotel uh, in uh, February of 2020, right when COVID was hitting. We were literally got out of uh, San Francisco airport as they were closing it, and it was kind of a crazy time. But here's the problem. So the valuation has dropped, as we've talked about earlier in the show, the valuation of commercial real estate is dropping precipitously. And so commercial real estate is not valued at once was. So loan to value ratios are completely different than what were on the books you know, just a year ago. So in other words, if, if you had a, a billion dollar asset and you, loan, you, you borrowed 700 million on it, you had 400 million in equity, right? And, and so, well, if it's revalued today, and we saw a building in San Francisco earlier this year sell, $300 million value building sold for 60 million. So now you just take that across that city. If you cut the valuation by 60, 70 percent, that that hotel that instead of being worth a billion would be worth maybe 300 million. Well, if you owe 700 million, it's only worth 300 million. Why are you going to continue to pay the loan? And I also talked about it earlier. We had the housing crunch happen in 08, 09, 2010, and we saw people walk away because they were underwater. That's what's happening in commercial real estate. If you borrowed money, and that's why those banks are going to be in trouble. We talked about earlier. Because who's going to be left holding the bag? Well, if the building's worth 300, the bank has a note on it for 700 million, and and the payer, the guarantee says, no mas, here you go, you can have the building back. That's what we secured the note with. Then the the bank's going to lose that 400 million in that example, right? So it's going to be uh, the problem is how much contagion does this? How far does this spread? And as you said, uh, there's so many banks that have commercial real estate office space in particular. I mean, if you've driven up and down Dodge Expressway here in Omaha, you've seen a lot of expansion of office space. There's a lot of empty space here, right? And that's going to be that way for a little while. Now we're better off than most cities. I will tell you that. I wouldn't. I wouldn't predict any damage, real carnage here. But there are cities that, as we mentioned, New York City, et cetera, that it's becoming a real, real problem. So, yeah, the hotels, et cetera, the, the office space, uh, all these commercial buildings in big cities are failing in value. Now, what adds on top of that, San Francisco in particular, is the crime wave going on, right? They're just they're letting people. They're letting people shoplift. They're letting homeless people, drug addicts lay on the streets. I mean, I talked about it. I walked out of that hotel and had to step over human feces to go to dinner. Yeah. It was it was yeah. disgusting. Uh, but I'm just telling you. So, And then the California Senate just passed a bill to make it illegal to stop a shoplifter out of your store. They're driving business away at a record rate. Yet I believe uh, the leader of that state is going to throw his hand in the ring here soon for president of the United States. Look what I yeah. did here. Look, look what I can do for you. So uh, anyway, it, it's it's really unique times we're in right now. But yeah, there, there's carnage out there. But again, that will present opportunity. Now, if you were the investor that happened to have the cash and could come buy that building for $300 million off of that bank's balance sheet, that will happen at some point in the future. 
there will be a long-term really nice it's return. Better, that someday that building will be worth it. Absolutely, if yeah. a billion, at least, you know, six or seven hundred million. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so that's, that's how opportunity comes about is uh, there's crisis and there's things yeah. that happen. But if you're a wise and good steward of capital, you can look to these opportunities and find the, the sweet spot, so to speak, and potentially make some decent money. But so the answer to the questioner is, yeah, that building may have been priced at a billion when the transaction was set up, but the market reality now is it's worth maybe a third of that. And uh, that's why the... Uh, uh, well, what you have to understand too, just walk away from property taxes in San Francisco are about 1.2% of that assessed value. So think about that. Ooh, that much. yeah, that's a pretty big number, right? Yeah. That's a hundred and some million dollars <laughs> on, a, on a billion yeah. six or okay. whatever. You know. So uh, anyway, yes. by the numbers, it does make sense. Yeah. Wow. All right, um, David. Here's a question about Tesla. I'm in my seventies and retired. One of my bucket list items is to get a Tesla. I saw something about Tesla insuring its own vehicles. What do you think? Would Tesla be a better arrangement? than using a conventional insurance company? I don't know. I mean, I, I would just tell you, um, just be careful, right? Because you gotta understand is, is Tesla just basically, the, their stock just went crazy again and, and good or bad, whatever, because GM and Ford have both now committed to using the same charging plugs, if you will. So, so in other words, if you buy a GM vehicle in the future, you better plug into a Tesla charging station. So what Tesla has done is in effect, guaranteed to give themselves more competition right so th that's the the one part you got to worry about number two now they're trying to make up the revenue loss if they have more competition by having you add on insurance into your lease or purchase agreement with them directly well that typically means anti-competitive situation and they, they kind of state in the article that basically they're going to price it based on your driving habits etc so uh, you you know if your monthly bill could change every month based on your habits in one month, you, you drove from here to, I don't know, Denver or something, and, oh, well, your insurance went up $200 this month. Why? Well, you drove additional it's miles. It's fluctuate monthly. Yeah, it can fluctuate. So How can I, you budget for that? Yeah, so that would be interesting to see. But again, uh, listen, Elon Musk has always been an innovator and a disruptor in industries. And so, but what this might lead to is new ways to look for auto insurance. Because I will tell you, that's one of the number one areas. We just had core inflation come out this week still. 5.3%. Auto insurance is the number one inflation item in the whole list of charts of areas, up 17% year over year for folks. So, so there's going to be disruption. You're, you're seeing companies like Allstate and and, uh, and State Farm just leave the whole state of California. They're just exiting these states because they can't afford to compete anymore for regulation and inflationary pressures on the supply chain of you know having to file the claims, et cetera. So maybe it's a viable option. I don't know. I don't own a Tesla. I don't plan on owning a Tesla, but I would just be weary that you know, make sure you read the fine print. That would be my my answer. Just read the fine print. And, and I always like to shop. You better shop your auto insurance. One of the things Michael Luna does for us right here at Smart Protection is, you know, about every three years, we have our clients just run their, their what's called deck pages through Mike's office, and they'll just shop it real quick with 40 carriers to make sure you're paying the right price. But, you know, for convenience, it might be a nice chip. Have it all in one roof, so to speak there. But you may end up overpaying. I don't know. Well, or that, that initial bill may be a low ball. Oh, it's beating everybody else's rates. This looks great. But you're saying in month three, four, or five, that could shoot way up. Yeah, based on your driving <laughs> habits. That's, right. what, they, that's what they state. So. Oh, my goodness. But anyway, okay. it, look, if, if, you got, if you're out there and you would like to have somebody answer simple questions like this for you, we're, we, we've got a couple of slots open this week. I haven't been doing this in a while, but we have six 15-minute uh, point appointments on the phone with a licensed advisor available to anybody this week that would like to just speak with one of our advisors and uh, you know get your most pressing question answered. What, what? Well, that, that's good because we're out of time for Q&A this week, but uh, now those six slots will fill up quickly. 402-369-7777. There's no charge, there's no obligation, but if you'd like to get a retirement question answered by one of our licensed financial advisors, call in and schedule a complimentary 15-minute phone conference, 402-369-7777. Up next, are you thinking of raiding that 401k for emergency funds? Let's talk about it first. Let's talk about it next on Retire Smart with David Brooks. Welcome back to Retire Smart with David Brooks. I'm Chip Maxwell. David, uh, the, uh, the website Rethinking65 had this headline, Vanguard. Fidelity, notice troubling rise in 401k hardship withdrawals. 
You said along the message is the dam cracking. This has come up before in our Q and A's in, in uh, the last few years. Every once in a while, somebody will ask about this, dipping into the 401k, which is allowed, but you've always kind of raised a warning flag about it. Uh, I, I think this is what we're talking about, right? Well, yeah, and this is your, your you know, a last ditch effort when you're trying to, you, you've got nowhere else to go get capital. And unfortunately, means you're probably in, 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 you know, in a little bit of dire economic straits at the time. Uh, but 22 million people, according to this article last year, started, it took hardship withdrawals, right? out of their 401k. So it took money out, paid taxes and penalties on it, took it out early uh, to, to just get by, to pay their bills. And they quote a couple people in the article, it's just they cannot get by with the cost of living. And again, while inflation, the core number seems to be going down, it was it was 4% this, this past month, uh, year over year CPI. Core inflation for the 27th month is over 5%, 5.3%. Now that's stacking, Chip. We're now in our third year of these inflationary numbers. So you have to understand is you've got five or 6% inflation. Then the next year we had it up to 9% last June and then another 5% now. That's 20%, those three years of inflationary numbers. And wages certainly are not keeping up with 20% over the last, you know, since two and a half years ago or so. So people are struggling to get by, which is why we, we talk about what, unfortunately what we think is coming is an earnings retraction, an earnings recession will happen. And that will typically reset the prices of equities and this this year we've had such a narrow market literally seven stocks are responsible for over a hundred percent of the return of the major indices this year and that will not sustain itself for very long it, it can go another couple months it could but at some point that will have to correct and, and look math tells us this history tells us this so i would just encourage our, our listeners be prepared understand the amount of risk or beta, how much volatility you have within your portfolio. And we have a really great tool where we can actually show you what the predicted down draws will be whenever that correction happens. And then you simply ask yourself, are you comfortable with that amount of drawdown in your portfolio? Aren't the payback terms really strict as well? That it, there, there was at least one couple in this story where, okay, they took the money out and, and then one of them lost a job. And so then they're unable to comply with the payback terms. Yeah, Doesn't that bring down a whole other load of pain on you when that happens? So so they were talking about, so you have hardship withdrawals. They also talked about loans, right? And we talk yeah. about you can borrow in most cases against your 401k. Again, we discourage that uh, simply because of what just happened to that couple. So let's just say you've got $500,000 saved up in your, your 401k at work. Oh, you can get a loan and you borrow $200,000 out. And we've seen people do this. And I mean, we had clients do this without telling us. And we're like, why'd you do it? Well, I wanted to lend the money to my kid or whatever to help them buy a house or, or good intentions or just pay their own bills. But in the, in the example, what happens, say somebody borrowed 200 or 50,000, whatever the number is, you're going to pay it back, Chip, through payroll deduction. And these terms are going to take the loan and divide it by one, two or three years typically. So you're usually going to have a three year payback. So they're going to deduct that from your paycheck, every single paycheck. For the next three years, you're going to get less take-home pay by a pretty good margin based on what you borrow, plus paying interest back into the plan. So it can it can hurt your cash flow going forward significantly. Then what happens is, oh my gosh, and it happened here. That company downsized the person, right? They were let go, Chip. Now you have 90 days to pay that loan back, or it is a distribution. So they're going to send you 1099 because now it's a taxable distribution that you took. And if you were not 59 and a half, oh, no. you, know, you yeah. may be paying a 10% penalty on top of state income yeah. tax and federal income tax. And it can end up costing you up to, uh, in some cases, 45, 50% of the distribution can be lost to the tax man and hardship penalties. So think, think it through is really the advice I'd have to give here. Think it through, make sure, is this really the only option you have available? Because it's not as rosy as it sounds. And of course, uh, this is what, what people do in desperate times. And again, we hope that that's not you. We hope you're not in that case. We want you to be proactive in your, your financial future planning, have an emergency fund and keep building it up. We are gonna be going in tougher economic times. This will be a time where you're gonna wanna have a bigger savings account, not a smaller one. David, uh, there's a headline here from CNBC about Social Security, and I guess it's kind of good news, bad news. And it reminds me that earlier on this show, you mentioned that core inflation is still 5.3%. Well, here's the headline. Social Security cost of living adjustment may be 2.7% in 2024. That's according to an estimate by the Senior Citizens League. And uh, 
that can be a problem if core inflation is at 5.3%, right? That's going to be a real problem. Now, we were blessed the last two years. We had over 5%, 8.7%, as you almost said, 14.5%, close to 15% in the last two years. But for the last 10 years, Chip, the COLA raise has averaged 2.6%. And since inception, it's averaged about 2.8%. So this is in line with historical numbers, the 2.7, if that is it. But historically speaking, we've seen better numbers. They Again, they tweak the calculation here based on CPI and their, their future projections of it to where this is going to be. And so, but if real sticky inflation, core inflation, with the grocery store inflation, those things are still there. This will harm a lot of seniors that are living as their primary source of income being that Social Security check. David, I saw a term in that story that I've never seen before, CPI-E. Apparently, there is a consumer price index specifically geared to the elderly. That's what the E is. Absolutely. We talk, talk about senior inflation, and some people want to use that as the as the metric that they would adjust the COLA basement. And, and of course, I would tell you there are times where it looks better to do it, times where it looks worse, mm. uh, but it also leaves out many of the factors in seniors' actual inflation, right? And so healthcare doesn't get counted correctly in that equation. And therefore, I don't believe it's an accurate assumption. And there's people in Congress that say, oh, it's not gonna be accurate, we're not gonna do it. So, uh, you know, I don't think they'll add it in there, but they talk about that would be an option to maybe if, it, if that number were higher, they would give people a higher raise, et cetera. But unfortunately, we know with Social Security's uh, dismal numbers, you know, just less than a decade out, I wouldn't expect you to get any more grossy benefits, you know, of anything. I think the COLA adjustments will, will continue to be uh, wound down a little bit. David, our final topic this week, this has been a recurring topic over the last few years, and in case anyone was wondering, it's still happening. Uh, the Fox Business headline is, Great Migration Continues as More Americans Flee to Florida, Texas. I want to read one statement from the story, David, and then turn you loose. This is right out of the story. This population shift paints a clear picture, said Janelle Fritz, a policy analyst at the nonpartisan Tax Foundation. People left high-tax, high-cost states for lower-tax, lower-cost alternatives. And, uh, well, David, California, Illinois, and New York are hemorrhaging people by the hundreds of thousands. You're a data guy, and the data is well, not... Well, no, and what, what it actually shows is this is accelerating. It's not stopping. During COVID, it happened. So, so collectively, you had uh, San Jose, just south of San Francisco area, they lost about 4% of their population during the 2021-22, right? 2020, 2021, 2022. So in those, that three-year period, the COVID, people could work remotely and all that happened. So people got out of that high cost of living area and migrated 4%. They're losing 1% a quarter now, Chip. That's 4% a year. So wow. this is accelerating yeah. because these areas have added new tax, new regulations, and, and are, are, are actually proposing and hiring. Chicago, Illinois is now trying to propose a wealth tax on its citizens, and they're driving people out. So the benefactors are, again, states that have a more tax-friendly environment. And of course, the big two benefactors have been Texas and Florida. Austin's population grew by 1% in the first half of this year already. And so, and that they're busting at the seams, which will hold the real estate values most likely in a place like that for a little while longer. Uh, but it, it's getting to the point where people are voting with their wallets, Chip, and we always talk about this, polit politics aside, you can't make it where you can't afford to live there or you're gonna have to pick up and go. And those that have means are doing just that, right? And so who's left to pay the bill are those that don't have the means to transport somewhere else or to, to migrate somewhere else. They can't afford to leave. And so they're the ones trapped in the cities and societies. They're going to regulate and tax them into oblivion. And, and, and listen, not to put it down on chip, but right here in Nebraska, we talk about this with our school boards over taxing our residents to a, you know about 40%, in my opinion. These schools are not run efficiently. You shouldn't have eight school systems in the greater Omaha area. You should have probably Douglas County Schools and Sarpy County Schools. And I know that may not be popular and people love their little school district, but you're bloated, you're paying all these all these administrators, all these other people that don't need to pay. You could save $20 million a year in these eight school districts just by consolidating. Simple, simple math. I'm grinning because as a state senator, I saw it and it comes up every few years. One city, one school district, as you just said, one county, one school district, Oh my goodness, do the long knives come out and you find out that the biggest gorilla in the Capitol building, it's not the Chamber of Commerce, but it's, it's not, not business, the, yeah. it's, not, it's big education. Happy to no debate education. anybody on this issue, happy to debate, but their logic is for their lining their pockets and their vendors, yeah. the, who they sell, who they buy the curriculum from, that's who's driving this. 
not the student's well-being. And, that, and I think that's coming to change. We have school choice here in Nebraska now. We haven't a chance to talk about that, and that will change because students are going to start migrating to private schools. And my prediction, in three years from now, you'll have enrollment down 15% or more in, in Nebraska public schools. Well, that might force some change and some revision. Um, in the meantime, uh, some people are relocating from California to Florida, Texas, from New York to, to Florida. Uh, maybe you don't need to relocate. Maybe stay right where you are, but maybe you need to relocate some things within your portfolio. Well, that, be proactive in the tax planning so you understand how these new rules and changes here in Nebraska can fi fix you up in pretty good shape. Great news on our income tax here being lowered over the next three years. Social Security tax going away next year. Lots of positive news. We can explain all that to you. And, and I would just tell people, get our tax guide, our tax planning guide. That's a great start. Or, or, that, or come in for the report card. That's 32 pages full of charts and graphs, great content, great information in the tax guide. Now, if you want to dip a toe in the water, we've got six openings for a call with one of our financial advisors, but don't wait. Those fill up. If you want to take a plunge, get the complimentary report card, comprehensive review of your entire financial situation. And don't forget about Eric Blankmeyer, the managing director of Private Wealth. If you're a high net worth family requiring some unique strategies for any and all of those, 402-369-7777, 402-369-7777. David, bring us home. Have a blessed and prosperous week and let's have a great College World Series. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to Retire Smart with David Brooks. I'm Chip Maxwell. For David Brooks and the entire team at Retire Smart, have a great week.